Good morning, everyone. It's so nice to see you all here. I hope everyone, I know we still have some people coming in through the, through the doors, but maybe we can all um, get settled and um, we can get started so we can stay on schedule for our full program today. My name is Mike Potter, and on behalf of UCSF's Clinical and Translational Science Institute, I'm, I'm delighted to welcome you here today. We had a record registration for this event, and many of you are here on campus for the first time, so please let us know if you have any special needs or accommodations we can help take care of. También para los que hablen español, por favor, háganselo saber, ya que tenemos servicios de traducción simultánea para ustedes. And um, one of our speakers will actually be speaking in Spanish, and we actually have, um, for those of you who don't speak Spanish and want to have simultaneous translation into English, um, we have some limited... Uh, oh, all right, so it's going to be simultaneously translated um, aloud so everyone can hear it. Thank you. I wasn't sure how that was going to work. So. The mission of the Clinical and Translational Science Institute is to facilitate clinical and translational research to improve patient and community health. This meeting is sponsored by two of CTSI's programs, the San Francisco Bay Collaborative Research Network, which facilitates UCSF research partnerships with community-based healthcare organizations and the Impacting Policy by Accelerating Translation Program, also known as the IMPACT Program, which supports partnerships to quicken the adoption of research evidence into policy across healthcare, government, and industry. More information on these programs, including our websites, can be found on the back page of your program. At our last conference in January of 2023, we reflected on how the COVID-19 pandemic exposed weaknesses not just in the healthcare system, but also in our social safety net and several exemplary academic community partnerships were highlighted, including the work of Umoja Health to reach out and galvanize advocacy of the healthcare needs of the African American communities, the UCSF Fresno COVID-19 Equity Project, which leveraged local partnerships to address the testing, treatment, and vaccination needs of thousands of Fresno County residents, um, partnerships with regional uh, school leaders to navigate through controversial school safety policies in the face of rapidly changing public perceptions and scientific evidence, and many more. And we also actively explored, many of you will recall, the findings from the Here with Community Project, which identified healthcare research priorities best addressed with community-wide approaches, such as interventions to address social isolation, structural racism, and access to care, especially for individuals without citizenship or with limited health insurance coverage. So, as you can see from today's meeting agenda, our morning session will continue our exploration of many of these themes that were laid bare by the COVID-19 pandemic with presentations that can help us map the future of community-engaged research and action. This will be followed by 90 minutes for net a networking lunch and a poster session during which we hope you'll have time to connect with each other and with our poster presenters. Then the afternoon session will start with an introduction to CTSI and its many community-facing services by Vanessa Jacoby, UCSF's Associate Vice Chancellor for Clinical Research. And immediately following, there will be an interactive workshop where we'll grapple with and brainstorm solutions to real-world challenges in community-engaged research. And you'll want to stay to the very end for our keynote presentations by California Secretary of Housing, Tamika Moss, and UCSF Health's President and CEO, uh, Suresh Gunasekran. So now I'm delighted to hand over the mic to Laura Schmidt, co-director of the IMPACT program, for a few additional introductory comments and acknowledgments. Thanks, Mike. Morning. So uh, the UCSF IMPACT program supports UCSF and its partners in translating science for policymakers. Today we're talking about impacting the social determinants of health, inequities in housing, labor, 
and broadly the unequal distribution of resources between the haves and the have-nots. The best way to impact this is by coming together like we are today, community, health system stakeholders, and researchers to push for meaningful changes in policies that drive upstream and downstream social determinants of health. We want to thank you for coming today, especially our community partners who've come from long distances to spend the day with us. The fact that you're here and ready to engage in a meeting like this really means a lot to us. And your feedback's important, so whether you can be here all day or just part of the day, please don't forget to complete the program evaluation that can be accessed by the QR code, which is on the back of your meeting program. We also want to acknowledge the hard work of our CTSI staff, none of whom are in the room. They're all out there working. Uh, they put together today's meeting, including facilitators and speakers, and um, we have many volunteers uh, helping out today with logistics. And I particularly want to make a shout out to Ziada Tuwalde, Miriam Hanum, Erica Wong, Yuro Sabios, Roberto Vargas, and Paula Fleischer. We want to acknowledge Rana Bahar for her support. She's out ill today, unfortunately, and Saji Mansur for his steadfast and tenacious attention to detail that's gotten us to this point. Take a moment to thank them. And finally, I want to thank UCSF and CTSI for seeing the importance of this work and for providing the funding to make this meeting possible. Thanks. Hi, everybody. I'm Hilary Seligman, and uh, I co-direct Impact with Laura Schmidt. And it gives me really great pleasure to introduce our first panel today. So if those speakers want to come up. Um, we, this panel is representing UCSF's Benioff Homelessness and Housing Initiative and their work on the California statewide study of people experiencing homelessness. We have coming up first on the stage, Dr. Margot Cushell, whose career has been um, dedicated at UCSF to preventing and ending homelessness through research and policy, and has also been a great mentor and friend to me in how we do impactful work that is both in the community and impactful for policy. She is joined next by Dr. Kara Young-Ponder, an educator and social justice practitioner who leads community partnerships at the UCSF Benioff Homelessness and Housing Initiative, and then by Robin Rose Hamer, who is Vice President at Capital Impact in Sacramento. Thank you for coming all that way. And a member of the uh, California Statewide Study of People Experiencing Homelessness Lived Experience Advisory Board. Please welcome them all to the stage. Thank you so much for that introduction, and thank you for being here. Um, we are going to um, talk today a little bit about our theory of change at BHHI, how we do things, talk about the California statewide study as an example of that. And we've left lots of time for question and answers and hope to turn this into a conversation. Um, the BHHI is a research and Policy Center based at UCSF um, in the Center for Vulnerable Populations. We were established about five years ago as a um, initiative that is seeking to both do identify what questions are important to answer to prevent and end homelessness, to either um, curate and disseminate existing research or where the research doesn't exist to conduct the research. And we have a very big emphasis on um, translating those um, findings to policymakers, programmatic leaders. We have four main pillars of the BHHI, which are research, education, um, policy and communication, which we see as all interrelated and overarching all of it 
is community engagement, because we believe that none of it can happen without that. And so um, today we're going to talk, um, this is uh, some of our, one of our BHHIers um, in the field doing an interview. Today we're going to talk a little bit <clears throat> about how we think of things. So at BHHI, we used a combined model that we sort of adapted from Brownell and um, Roberto's um, strategic science model adapting it with an emphasis on community engagement. And so our sort of theory of change is that in our work, we seek to identify change agents. Those are often executive branch folks, legislative staff at the local, state, and, and federal level, as well as um, people who, let's say, run nonprofits, advocacy groups, and impacted communities. We work with them to develop strategic questions, meaning that often policymakers will come with a question that isn't phrased as a research question, but the question is at the root of what needs to be answered. So we work with them to take those questions and think about it as researchers. We then conduct scholarship and then we work on feeding it back in a sort of constant feedback loop. The thing that we perhaps change from um, Brunel's model is that we believe that there can be no research or policy making that has any legitimacy if you don't involve the people who are closest to the problem. So we would call those impacted community members, people with lived experience, people who are currently experiencing homelessness, as well as government and policy leaders, advocacy groups, and nonprofit leaders. So we are in constant communication um, with those groups and co-develop our work with them and then disseminate it. Because what we have found is that too often researchers like come up with an idea, do an entire study, and then are sort of like, wait, pay attention to me, make changes based on this. But at that point, they've often asked the wrong questions, conducted it the wrong way, or just haven't really built any buy-in to listen to those answers. So. <laughs> um, today we're going to focus on one of our big projects toward a new understanding, the California Statewide Study of People Experiencing Homelessness. We released the main results of this um, last June in this report. We are continually releasing other results um, through a series of smaller mini reports. We have one coming out in a few weeks um, on aging. Um, this study was really um, started um, at the request of um, the California Health and Human Services Agency where Secretary Mark Galley um, called us up and asked us to do this study. We had a lot of back and forth with the secretary um, because actually we pushed back a little bit, to be honest, and said we didn't think the study needed to be done. Didn't we already know all of this? And we went back and forth with sort of dueling memos for a series of um, weeks to months until we agreed to do it. This study is the largest representative study of homelessness in the United States since the 1990s. It's a representative study of adults experiencing homelessness. Oh, sorry. Um, sorry about that. Um, it is a representative study of adults who experience homelessness um, uh, throughout the state of California. And it's a mixed method study, meaning that we did surveys, that we did um, carefully in order to generate a representative sample, and then um, allied or aligned um, in-depth interviews or qualitative research to really get at the richness of the experience. <clears throat> so um, to show how we mapped this on to our theory of change, the California Health and Human Services Agency approached us. It is hard to be less community engaged than to have basically the governor's office of the largest state in the nation approach you and ask you to do something. That is pretty much the opposite of community engagement. But we said that we would only do it if we could do it in a community engaged method. And so we immediately convened three advisory boards. One we called the Policy and Practice Advisory Board, made up of local, state, and federal leaders, both in government, nonprofits, and advocacy groups. 
One was um, not to play favorites, but we think the most important group, the Lived Expertise Advisory Board, of which um, Robin is a member. And then the third we called the Learning Community Advisory Board of representatives from the counties in which we were in because we felt like we needed to have a way to talk to the people directly where we were actually conducting the study so that we could learn together about breck processes but also create a mechanism so that we would find out if there were any issues. Um, with those groups, we developed, conducted, and analyzed the study with ongoing guidance, meaning that those groups helped us choose interview topics, refine the, the questionnaire, develop interview guides, um, participate in data analysis of both quant and qualitative, um, provide a lot of guidance on how we actually conduct the study, and then are our partners in disseminating it. And then we, with our partners, um, have been disseminating the findings. <clears throat> so the policy and practice board was comprised of elected officials, staff or representation, as I said, from local, state, and national government, representatives from city and county departments working on both housing and homelessness, community organizations who work either directly or adjacent to unhoused populations, unhoused organi uh, organizations, um, advocacy organizations, and service providers. And um, how we collaborated on it um, was that we brought it, that group brought in policy expertise, for instance, to survey question development and qualitative topics. We went to them and said, what are the questions that you need to know? What are the things that would be most helpful? What are the big policy issues here? And then sort of vetted ideas with them. Um, they brought policy and programmatic expertise to both survey and qualitative data of interpretation. We would go to them as findings were coming in and say, does this make sense to you? How would you think about this? Are there policy opportunities here? They provided input into the policy recommendations emerging from the study. And then they really have been partners with us to leverage the findings into action. They might say, hey, there's this, you know, this um, city council that's really struggling with this that could actually hear from you. I have a connection there. Here is someone at the legislative office. Our federal partners did a lot to help connect us to federal government officials. Um, they make connections with policymakers and provide nearly an endless source of speaking opportunities. Next slide. Um, and then finally, we still have ongoing monthly meetings. So this happened from, from the idea of the study, and it's, my last meeting was last week, and it's still going on. We have monthly scheduled meetings with high-level state leaders from the executive branch. They had no control over our findings. We paid for the study. Um, the state did not pay for it, which wound up being an enormous blessing in disguise because they had no veto power over anything we said. But we also didn't want to surprise them. And we still don't want to surprise them. So we let them know early on when we found things that we thought might be problematic for them or might be interesting so that they had advanced warning and could think through a response. They also have been extremely helpful in helping us identify what the key policy issues are. And, um, and it just really gives them a heads up and it's really a great two-way co you know, conversation. They help us interpret our results and think about where the policy opportunities may be, where the problems might be, but it also allowed them to, us to build trust with them and to let them know that we wouldn't catch them flat-footed in such a sort of politically difficult area. I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague Robin to take it from here. Thank you, Margo, and good morning, everyone. <laughs> Along with the Policy and Practice Advisory Board, we also convened a Lived Expertise Advisory Board, or LEAB. The LEAB was a group of 10 advisors from across the state of California who represented a wide range of lived or living experiences of homelessness from rural and urban communities living sheltered and unsheltered, young and old, in families and single. 
Our board came together before field work began and were trusted partners to the BHHI team through each stage of the research and analysis process. Why, you may ask, do we use the term expertise and not experience? As board member Sage Johnson says, the term expertise really puts in the fact that not only do we have life experience of that event or navigating whatever took place, expertise comes in how we structure our experience into constructive criticisms, insights, inputs, and feedback to the applicable parties. I have been shut down in rooms before using experience alone. So with expertise, it's like, no, you can't refute what I'm saying. I have a track record of being in these rooms and helping. I'm an expert. In other words, people who have lived experience are uniquely able to understand the entire context of what is happening for people in a way that organizations cannot always see. For this reason, it is important for lived experts to be recognized as proximate leaders in the collaborative process. Before and during data collection, the lived expertise advisory board members provided feedback on the survey, helped create in-depth interview guides, helped train frontline staff, oh, sorry, um, connected the BHHI team to outreach workers across the state, attended meetings with county leadership, and helped BHHI develop fieldwork best practices. During the data analysis and dissemination phases of the CASPA, LEAB members helped BHHI staff make meaning out of study results for the final report, conducted interviews with national news media outlets about the CASPA, co-presented the findings of the CASPA with BHHI researchers to local, state, and national audiences, served on academic paper writing teams where we help researchers make meaning of the CASPA findings and to serve as co-authors, and provided and still provide ongoing critical analysis writing, and thought leadership on toolkits, mini reports, policy briefs, opt-eds, and so much more. Here we are presenting at several major national conferences focused on housing and homelessness, such as the National Conference of the National Alliance to End Homelessness and the National Leadership Conference of the National Coalition for the Homeless. We encouraged any organizations that would like to work with lived experts to build a circle of trust that includes fair compensation, trauma-informed facilitation, a plan for addressing barriers, and taking feedback seriously. The first component of the circle of trust is compensation. It is extremely important that lived experts get paid on par with researchers for the work that they are asked to do. And this includes payments for meetings, work in between meetings, and processing time. The second part of the circle of trust is trauma-informed facilitation. Lived expertise advisors are asked to provide insights and interpretations on research and programs through their personal experiences. Revisiting these experiences is hard. It can re-traumatize board members and cause vicarious trauma for collaborators. To be trauma-informed is to understand the way that traumatic experiences may have impacted the lives of community members and how policies and practices may bring that trauma back to the surface. The third part of the circle of trust is taking feedback seriously. It doesn't mean a lot to have a seat at a table if what you say is not considered to be valid or legitimate. It is also not useful to be at a table if your feedback is elicited after key decisions have already been made. Transparency is a key principle of authentic and meaningful partnership between lived experts and organizations how will you communicate the changes that you make or don't make in the process of your project or research back to board members? 
And the last part of the circle of trust is creating a plan for addressing barriers. Will your organization offer mental health support for people? If you cannot offer mental health support, do you have a staff person who will hold space for members who need to process? Or will you offer training? After building a circle of trust, it's important to build community. Here are some of the ways that we built community at the BHHI LEAP. So first we recommend, how do I go back? Oh no, do you know how to go back? Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> um, so first we recommend that you schedule one-on-one -on -one conversations with each member. And this is really important to get to know people and to establish that um, bi-directional relationship of feedback where everybody knows that they have an ally within the organization that they can talk to day to day. We recommend that your organization assess whether board members need childcare, transportation assistance, or anything else to attend meetings. And if lived experts have the technology they need to conduct board-related work, including laptops or tablets and wireless internet, we reckon, recommend that your organization earmark funds to provide board members with wireless internet or a device that connects to the internet if needed. We also recommend that you assess board members or lived experts learning thinking and feedback styles. There are so many different ways to learn to think and to give feedback. And to be trauma-informed means that we think about the different ways that our community members around a table want to best engage with the material. Um, if that's through illustrations or spoken direction, handouts, hands-on projects, and opportunities to think and give feedback in a variety of ways. We recommend that you set up an internal structure to support the board before you begin this work. Our internal structure included a lead facilitator, a note taker and an additional point of contact, administrative support for payment processing, each of whom were BHHI staff and two board co-chairs who were LEAB members. And just a note on that, I think that's really important because despite organizations' best efforts, because of power and positionality, um, we can say or do things that are really hurtful or cause trauma. And so to have various points of contact within a community-engaged organization project means that people have other people besides the leader of the group who they can go to and say, hey, that was really triggering for me, if they don't feel comfortable going to the lead facilitator. We also recommend that you create community agreements. Community agreements are a set of principles and rules that a group of people co-develop to guide how they will work together. These agreements are key to ensuring group dynamics center around respect, inclusivity, safety, and open dialogue. Get to know each other. Building community and trust requires personal connections. Personal connections require that members of a community spend time getting to know one another. It also requires that community members get to experience hearing their voice in the communal space and having their ideas received, affirmed, and uplifted in the community. And finally, we recommend that you create grounding and centering exercises because so much of this work depends on us asking community members to advise us based on their lived experience, which just by virtue of what it is can bring up trauma and people can share things that are hard. And when that happens, it's often important as a community that we can recenter and ground ourselves back to what we're doing in the present moment. Now that we've shared our community engagement strategies with you, we'd like to tell you about the CASPA methods and findings. The CASPA was conducted between October of 2021 and November of 2022. Our dedicated field staff traveled to eight countries, sorry, 
counties across the state and conducted surveys with people currently experiencing homelessness. Here's a photo of one of our field workers, Angelica, doing a survey with a respondent. And here's a photo of our lovely team at the end of a day of surveys. See, they still have smiles on their face at the end of the day. <laughs> Designed to be representative of adults 18 and older experiencing homelessness in California, the study included 3,200 administered questionnaires and 365 in-depth interviews with adults experiencing homelessness in eight counties in, in eight regions of the state. We chose one county from each of the eight regions purposefully, sorry, purposefully, to best represent the diversity of California. Each color on the map represents a separate region. Within each county, we used venue-based sampling, surveying a random sample of all places where people experiencing homelessness congregate, including encampments, shelters, free and low-cost food programs, and taking a random sample within those places. To supplement the sample for hard-to-reach populations who we might have missed in the venue-based sampling, we did respondent-driven sampling. Simultaneously, we conducted seven different qualitative studies, choosing people purposes. Okay, I practiced this 400 times this morning. <laughs> I promise you. My, my brain keeps wanting to say purposely, and that's not correct. Based on the res their responses of the survey, we conducted interviews in English and Spanish and used interpreters for other languages. So what did we find? People experiencing homelessness in California are Californians. 90% of participants lost their last stable housing in California. A larger proportion of participants were born in California than Californians overall. 75% of participants were last housed in their current county. Communities of color are greatly overrepresented in populations of people experiencing homelessness. In CASPA, 26% of participants indicated a black racial identity. When we look at California's general population, only about 7% of Californians do. Similarly, participants who indicated a Native American, Alaskan Native, or Indigenous as one of their racial identities represented 12% of our sample. Across the state of California, about only 3% of Californians do. 35% of participants identified as Latino or Latinx as one of their identities. Our oldest participant was 89. Everyone who was in the study had to be at least 18 to participate. The median age of all participants was 47. Among single homeless adults or those 25 and older without minor children, the median age was 49. Nearly half, or 48% of all single adults were 50 or older at the time of the interview. Among single adults who are 50 or older, 41% became homeless at or after they turned 50. Pathways to homelessness differ. Nearly one in five participants, or 19%, entered homelessness directly from an institutional setting primarily prison and long-term jail stays. Approximately half, or 49%, entered from what we called a non-leaseholding arrangement, those participants who were doubled up, or in other housing arrangements that did not afford them legal protections of a lease. 32% entered from leaseholding arrangements in which they were formally named on a lease agreement. It comes as no surprise that high housing costs and low incomes leave many at increased risk for homelessness. The median monthly household income in the six months prior to homelessness was just $960 for all participants. Among non-leaseholders, the median monthly household income was $950. Almost half, or 43% of non-leaseholders did not pay rent 
living in arrangements such as being doubled up with family or friends and not contributing to rent. Among non-leaseholders who did pay rent, the median monthly housing cost was $450. Leaseholders contributed about half their monthly household income to rent. Their median monthly income in the six months prior to homelessness was $1,400, and median housing costs were $700. While people making $1,400 cannot afford to pay half of it in rent, those who lose such housing cannot re-enter the rental market paying as little as $700 a month. And now I'll turn it over to Kara to tell you more about the CASPA findings. Thank you, Robin. So we engaged our participants in a thought experiment. We asked them to recall a period of time prior to losing their last housing and to consider three hypothetical financial interventions that would have prevented their homelessness for a period of at least two years. Participants were optimistic that financial interventions would have meaningfully prevented their homelessness. 70% thought that a monthly shallow subsidy of between $300 and $500 a month would have prevented their homelessness. 82% believed that a one-time payment of between five and $10,000 would have done so. And 90% thought that a housing voucher that limited their rent to 30% of their income would have. So we asked participants a set of questions about what their lives were like currently experiencing homelessness. Participants were primarily unsheltered, meaning that they were living outdoors or in vehicles. 90% of all participants spent at least one night unsheltered during their current episode of homelessness. 78 percent had spent most of their time during the current episode unsheltered. About one in five, 21 percent, spent most of their time in a vehicle, and 57 percent in a non-vehicle, an encampment, a tent, or another place not meant for human habitation. 22 percent slept most of their time in a sheltered setting. Participants were in poor health. Reporting one's health as fair or poor has been shown to predict in research settings future hospitalizations or mortality. In our study, 45% of our respondents reported their health as fair or poor, and this is as opposed to good, very good, or excellent. And for context, across the U.S., 14% of people would report their health as fair or poor. 60% of participants had at least one chronic health condition, and 34% reported a difficulty with an activity of daily living. We asked participants to talk to us about their mental health. And what we learned is that mental health symptoms were quite common. 66% reported at least one mental health symptom, primarily driven by half of participants who reported either serious anxiety or depression, 51%, 48% respectively. 37% also told us that they had trouble remembering, concentrating, or understanding, and 12% reported hallucinations. We asked about illicit use, drug use and alcohol use, and we found that they were common. 35% of participants used illicit drugs three times a week or more during their current episode. 
Um, 31% of participants reported using non-prescribed methamphetamines at least three times a week. And so the drug use was primarily driven by methamphetamine use. 3% um, reported a regular use of uh, cocaine, and 11% reported regular non-prescription opioid use, such as fentanyl or heroin. Few reported opioid use without concurrent use of methamphetamines, reflecting current trends. We examined who reported either regular use of illicit drugs, weekly heavy episodic alcohol use, hallucinations, or a recent psychiatric hospitalization. 48% or half of respondents reported one of these. Experiences of violence were also common. 36% of our participants experienced physical violence during their current stay of homelessness. And of participants who experienced this, 49% said their perpetrator was a stranger. 10% experienced sexual violence during the current episode. And this breaks down um, differently by gender. So 7% of cisgender men, 16% of cisgender women, and 35% of transgender, non-binary, or gender non-conforming participants. Like with physical violence, 54% said their perpetrator was a stranger. And this is, um, this is notable uh, because before homelessness, people were much more likely to say that the violence that they experienced was from the hands of someone that they knew rather than a stranger. Participants wanted to be housed, which might come as no surprise to the people in this room. While feelings about temporary shelter were all mixed, all yearned for a safe, the safety and security of home. They identified critical barriers and that complicated their efforts, but most commonly they reported that the number one thing that was standing in their way was cost. 89% of people said, I just can't afford housing. And now I'm gonna pass it back over to Margo to tell us about our policy recommendations. So um, as we speak to uh, the press and more importantly, policymakers and the public about these results, we emphasize that every single route towards ending this crisis flows through increasing access to affordable housing options. And we have outlined a variety of ways to do this, focusing on things such like the point that currently only one in four American households who meet the strict criteria for receiving a housing voucher or housing subsidy actually receive it. We outline many other issues, including um, increasing access, so you know, enforcing anti-discrimination laws, providing housing navigation, um, producing, protecting, and preserving the supply of affordable housing. Our next intervention um, that we recommend is around prevention. Prevention is tantalizing and sounds great, and we're full on believers in it, but I will also say that prevention is hard. It turns out that it's very hard to predict who is going to experience homelessness. And so while our results that showed, you know, a five to $10,000 one-time payment, let's say, would have prevented it are very tantalizing, we do like to remind people that actually showing who is likely to become homeless is harder. So the one population that we are really, really pushing on are those leading institutional care. Such a huge proportion of people experiencing homelessness came directly out of institutions, primarily carceral institutions, although I'll add, because it's interesting to current policy debates, the next most common and the only other one that rose to a high level is drug treatment facilities. Um, we feel like this is a population who we are literally in carceral 
um, context holding against their will. And then we are discharging them knowingly into homelessness. Prevention in that context is not hard. And then 19% who came from institutional care is a true underestimate because many more had exited prisons in the six months prior to homelessness, but were given two to three months of housing, which was not enough for them to prevent their homelessness. Our next um, policy recommendation is that um, while we are in a very heightened and difficult political context where homelessness has been weaponized in a really ugly way and described inaccurately as a problem of addiction and mental health problems, and just to be clear, that is not the cause of homelessness. It is also true that people who have highly stigmatized conditions that interfere with function are the most likely to lose out in a brutal housing market and that the conditions of homelessness are so harrowing and, and are exactly the opposite of, of what people need that they both cause behavioral health conditions and interfere with treatment. And so what that means is that we are not doing us any favor if we deny the fact that probably about half of people currently experiencing homelessness have significant behavioral health needs. But to be clear, we do not think that this translates into the need for forced treatment or institutionalization. There is a robust evidence base that offering low barrier care for behavioral health conditions coupled with housing offered on a housing first basis can not only improve people's housing outcomes, but also improve their behavioral health conditions. Our next um, recommendation revolves around income. Obviously, if the problem is this mismatch between housing costs and income, you need to work on both ends of that. It is no surprise to us that we are very rarely find people experiencing homelessness who have had union jobs because union jobs tend to be much more likely to provide a living wage and a pension. And as I like to say archly about the expansion of older homelessness, that when you hear people talking about pension reform, I smile at them and I say, oh, you mean homelessness promotion. Um, so we really feel increasing benefits rates, increasing union membership, increasing um, minimum wage, all of these things will have an important effect. Um, we recognize that it has taken us a long time to get into this mess, and it's gonna take us a long time to get out of this mess. And we cannot abandon people who are currently experiencing homelessness. And we need to increase our outreach, particularly into encampments. We saw a huge discrepancy in sort of engagement with care with people in sheltered and unsheltered settings. And that we need to be sure that we are doing affirmative outreach with low barrier culturally appropriate care to people wherever they're experiencing homelessness to keep them safe and alive during this crisis and to do everything we can to get them out of it. And finally, with the unbelievable disparities in homelessness, and we like to point out that there is no way to talk about homelessness without talking about it as an issue of racial, uh, racial injustice that is a direct result of anti-black and anti-indigenous and other forms of racism in this country that is incumbent on us to embed a racial equity approach in all that we do in the response. When we um, came out with our study, we felt strongly that there was ways to convey directly to policymakers by building these relationships, by being prepared to talk to them, but we also recognize that policymakers don't get out ahead of the general public and that policymakers also read the newspaper and that we needed to engage media thoughtfully to make sure that we could disseminate our findings and our recommendations. Um, we um, planned this ahead of time. We actually hired a separate media firm, separate from what UCSF offers, because we felt like it could overwhelm UCSF's capacity. We were strategic about this, 
So to give you some examples, we chose 10 journalists from major outlets across the country and offered them an advance view under embargo of the report. We called up um, about four or five people. We were pretty sure that the media would call and we gave them an advance copy and, um, and which of course had our framing in it. So those 10 journalists um, had some time ahead of time to sort of write in depth stories. And then we did the usual press releases. It has now been covered by the media way more than a thousand times. It has been in every major national um, you know, media outlet. It's been in the New Yorker and the Atlantic and the New York Times and the Washington Post and the LA Times and all of them. It continues to be cited in newspapers. So we're tracking it that now it, you know, people cite it. And we think that this has helped us get the story out. We also engaged with a group called the Op-Ed Project to do um, a year-long training program for 20 of us, both faculty, staff, trainees, and LEAB members to get trained in writing op-eds. And we have um, produced so far over, since September, over 30 um, op-eds on homelessness in um, newspapers and other forms across, um, across the country. As Margot said, we really believe at BHHI that in order to end and prevent homelessness, we have to change perspectives, which means we have to change culture. And so in our dissemination strategy, we have many different prongs, uh, ways in which we're trying to get the message out there. One is through the media. One is through public talks like this one that we have been giving across the country since the CASPA came out. We also put on webinars once, about once a month um, on various topics. Here you can see a, a set of them, um, one on black Californians, experiences of homelessness, on intimate partner violence, on aging and homelessness, on the Lived Expertise Advisory Board, and a general webinar on the CASPA findings, kind of like we're giving to you today. We have released a set of, oh, we have um, given testimony, Margot has given testimony many times, um, based on the findings of the CASPA. And this is a really important way that we are engaging with policymakers to ensure that the narratives that they are using when they're thinking about policy around homelessness reflects um, the findings that we found in the CASPA and the reality of people's lives who are experiencing homelessness. So here is Margot giving testimony um, to the California State Assembly and also Margot with our former policy director, Tiana Moore in Washington, DC, giving testimony there. We have released a set of policy reports. You can find them on our website, homelessness.ucsf.edu. So far, we have released three. We have the main report toward a new understanding. We released a report on black Californians' experiences of homelessness called Toward Equity, and a report on intimate partner violence and homelessness called Toward Safety. We have several other reports that are forthcoming, behavioral health, Latinx experiences of homelessness, aging, health and homelessness, among others. And we are publishing academic papers on the CASPA. We have several that have already come out, several that are upcoming, and many more that are waiting to be written. We've also released a toolkit. And this is a toolkit on the work that our Lived Expertise Advisory Board did um, with the BHHI. It's on creating collaborative, meaningful, and authentic partnerships between organizations and people with lived experiences. 
So to sum this up, to go back to our theory of change, we engage in a hybrid theory of strategic science and community engaged research. We work with impacted communities, government and policy leaders, advocacy groups and nonprofit leaders. We identify those change agents. We work with them to develop strategic questions that we can research and provide them with um, answers and evidence to support the questions that are most meaningful to their community. We publish those results in a variety of mediums in order to engage all the audiences that we can through this diverse set of communication strategies that hopefully taken together will help us to not only provide rigorous evidence around what it takes to end homelessness, but to also um, communicate that out in many ways to help us to change culture and perspectives. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. We have about half an hour, and we've reserved half an hour in the hopes that we could get some dialogue and conversation uh, going. So please um, feel free to bring your questions to this group. Uh, Saji's walking around with the microphone. And as we're doing that, I want to start with the first question. Uh, that was tremendous. And one of the reasons that we really wanted to bring you to this forum which you guys really beautifully illustrated, is traditionally we've thought about policy-engaged research and community-engaged research as the far ends of a spectrum. And what you guys have done is brought all of that together. And I can imagine it's not all easy going, that there are some challenges in moving from one side of that spectrum to the other. So from each of your experiences and perspectives, can you talk about what kinds of challenges that brings and maybe even how you were able to address them. Well, thank you for the question. And I think it's important um, to acknowledge the fact that the work is hard, um, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't engage in it robustly. Um, knowing that it's hard helps you to, you know, gird your loins and set your intentions, but doing it anyway means that you care about the outcome and that, primarily was the goal. We cared about what happened with the work that we were doing. But in order to um, be honest, um, you know, some of the challenges are working with multiple uh, different personalities, right? Like you, you bring a disparate group of people who have separate sorts of functions in life, and then trying to figure out the commonality of how to work together. And Kara mentioned um, setting community agreements. That gives everyone an opportunity to come together and say, this is what's important to me and what needs to be honored for me in order for me to participate fully in this work. So also that level setting that we're all coming to the table as, as equals. I respect and deeply appreciate Dr. Margot Cushel and Dr. M Dr. Kara Ponder, but they're Margot and Kara to me. And one day I will be Dr. Robin Rose Hamer. So I will join the Academy too. Um, but the reality is that um, neither one of them sat on those well-earned loyals. And, and so there were no big eyes and little U's in our space. And that makes a huge difference too. Thank you, Robin. Um, you know, I, I don't know if anyone is a Marvel Universe fan in here, <laughs> but they just re-released the X-Men cartoon and my husband is a huge fan, so I've, I watch with him. And um, there's this line in there where the professor says, coexistence is messy. And I have been thinking about that so much as it relates to our work that um, I think we like to believe in organizations that if we have the structures just right, that everything just moves, but it never is the case. It's hard, even if you're in an organization where we're all being paid to move in the same direction, we're still not all moving in the same direction because coexistence is messy. 
And, and I think that that's the beauty of it. Um, I also was sitting in a, a forum where somebody from a different lived expertise advisory board was likening this process to planting seeds where you first have to like, you have to work with the earth for a while before anything can grow there. And that's what it felt like doing this project that we knew that we had a North Star, which was to do this important work together. Um, and it was bumpy, it was rocky. And I think part of it was that people come to the table with different languages, different ways of understanding the same thing. And that's why I emphasize the importance of having honest conversations about what is your learning style? What, how do you want to give feedback? Um, what is the best way for you to say to me or one of the other facilitators, I have no idea what you just said. Because um, let's be honest, in organizations, we develop languages and shortcuts for things that mean nothing to people outside. And it's really easy when you're on autopilot to just keep going, right? And, and so working with community in, in this case meant developing those bonds so that Robin could say, you missed it. You really missed it. You need to go back. And I'd be like, great, let's, let's go back, right? We got to get it right. So part of that is building community, which is messy. And then part of it is allowing people to lean into the ways that they feel most comfortable and being honestly themselves, thinking about something together, giving feedback on that thing and saying, I need help when we are talking way over everybody's head in our sort of academic language. Yeah, I, I love those. I'm gonna call it a, a few issues. One is that policymakers want everything yesterday, um, literally yesterday, and, um, and doing true community engagement takes time. And so there was that constant sort of balance. And we didn't always, it's easy to be up here and make it seem like we always got it right. We did not always get it right, but we put a lot of effort into trust and the ability to say, ouch, let's go back, let's redo it. I can say that I was often in the in the sort of place of like saying to the policymakers, like you just need to slow down. Like we don't wanna do this wrong and we're gonna, yes, we're gonna miss this deadline, but that's what it takes to do it right. So there's the time issue. Um, there's the money issue. Like we spent a lot of money on this study and believed very deeply that the community engaged portions of it were as important as anything else. Um, and we invested in it. I'm very aware that in like an NIH context, that can be much harder. And so I just wanna be obvious that it costs money that, you know, to be able to, you know, talk to the NIH about actually we need to buy tablets and Wi-Fi hotspots for all of these members of our community engaged board. And yes, this is the payment rate. It's not some small amount of money. It is a real income is, you know, is, is a hard conversation with the NIH, for instance, and we need to move them beyond that. Um, and then the last thing I will say is logistics are really hard. Like, you know, trying to pay anyone from UCSF with any speed. And our lived experience members, some of whom um, were, you know, living homeless. And like, if you don't pay me $500 for a month, it doesn't really make a difference in my life. For our, our lead members, it literally meant whether they could be housed or unhoused. And we had lots of conversations up to the highest level of UCSF saying like, you guys can't do this. You can't take a month to push out the money. And yet um, that is just the reality. So those are a small, and then, and then plus one to the language. Like we, you know, when we were doing co-analysis, um, and by the way, our lead members are co-authors on all of our academic papers, and their names are not just on there. They are 
truly co-authors, you know, you know, adding um, interpretive value, adding writing, adding um, thought leadership on those papers. But um, we had to keep doing sort of go back and go forth of like, we had a great conversation one day of like, what, what do, you know, I sort of said something about like, oh, peer reviewed papers as opposed to reports. And someone in the lead was like, what is a peer reviewed paper? I was like, oh, right, that's not language that any human being outside of academics actually uses. Let's talk about what it means to be, you know, a peer reviewed paper versus something else. Um, we did lessons on how to do qualitative data analysis. We did lessons on statistics, um, you know, and just try to sort of level set and slow us all down. And Margo, can I just add, I'm a doctoral student. I've taken four statistics classes and um, probably six uh, analysis, data analysis classes. And the explanation and training that I received from my BHHI peers was far superior <laughs> than those uh, semesters worth of classes. Like it was clearly, I, I, I went back to my notes and my books like, oh, that's what they were talking about. So, I mean, I, I truly believe that as a result of this experience, I will, I have the capacity now to conduct a research study and become a doctor. That this, it has been transformational in, in my academic life. So I, I cannot underscore enough the importance of like the, I call it the GUI, but that's because I was born before technology, but that's the thing in your computer that translates the zeros and ones to like your pretty little screen. Um, and they are the GUI. They really are to research. Bob. Yeah, th thank you. That, that was a tremendous uh, presentation. <laughs> I learned so much from that. Uh, but I, was, I have one question. Um, how many in the survey were working? And is it a dynamic process that you can describe from your answers you got? Um, so, so we think about, I think about, it depends how you define work because a lot of people were in the gig economy. And so we, you know, depending on what hourly cutoff we used, about 20% of adults experiencing homelessness um, in the study were um, working for pay in either formal or sort of gig work jobs. We do think that this might, have been um, depressed because we conducted it during the pandemic. And many, many people, particularly in the earlier months, you know, we were in the field from October 21 to November 22, um, were, for instance, gig workers who were not gig working because of the pandemic. So um, we think that that estimate might be depressed because of the timing of of when of when we did it, um, we took efforts to not lose people who were working because, of course, many people who experience homelessness who are working are working extremely long hours. So we were in the field super early in the morning, very late at night. But we also might have um, had some depression from that of missing people who were working sixteen, you know, seventeen hours a day. But we wound up with about twenty percent in the labor market. About forty-five percent were actively looking for work. I will say. Hi. Um, so, what an awesome presentation. Um, to introduce myself, I'm Ian Bennett. I'm a, I work at the uh, Family Health Services FQHC in Vallejo. And uh, we're hoping to join the CRN, and so very excited to be here today. Um, one of the things that uh, I, I was very interested in uh, what was mentioned about NIH, and of course that tends to be an institution, even PCORI, uh, <laughs> even um, CMS, uh, you know, with these places where the money really is to be able to do something academic, scholarly, um, that the conceptual model that you had from my perspective, kind of ended at communication, which, um, you know, if you think about the community partner, the history of community partner work from Paulo Freire and, you know, participatory action research where, you know, it's uh, much more activist. And it, I think my question really started walking across campus today and the silence, the conspicuous silence, you know, at this moment when we're so much is happening on campuses around the country. Um, so I, I guess I uh, wanted to, my, to 
I have a lot, you know, that we could say, but to limit it to a reasonable question. Um, what about that, uh, you know, whether it's implementation science or carrying out a trial using PCORI funds to study the impact of the social determinants of homelessness to improve, as you mentioned before, um, behavioral health outcomes and in a comparison way. How can we take the reins of these institutions and adapt them so that we can create uh, an evidence base not just of describing, which is incredibly important, and you know I don't mean to minimize that in any way, uh, but I think policymakers also want yesterday an example of something that actually results in a change rather than you know our, our guideposts of like if whatever changes we come up with we need to make sure it's a, uh, you know it's aligned with the evidence that you have but what about actual you know s studies that are hundreds of millions of dollars um, of work that is about actual solutions for unhoused uh, folks and things. So I, I'm just curious about how do we take advantage of those pots of money and the goal of, you know, that they uh, espouse of improving public health, right? And make sure that there, that is being used not just to improve careers, um, of, and I mean, you guys, I know, are totally aligned with me on all this. I'm not trying to lecture or anything, but you know, I'm trying to think of it like a strategic way and maybe even adapting, adding to that conceptual model where there's action in there, you know, rather than right. just communication, so. Yeah, no, 100%. I mean, first of all, I'll say that, remember how I said that um, we went back and forth with Secretary Galley? I, I basically, um, refused to do the study for a number of months because I kept saying we don't need to keep describing the problem. And what the secretary told me is, you know most of these things, I know most of these things, although we did identify some things that actually we did not know. And, and so we went back and forth. He's like, can you answer this, 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 and this? And I said, I, we can answer this and this. And he's like, well, how about this and this? And I was like, I'm pretty sure. And he's like, are you pretty sure or do you know? And so we identified some things we didn't know. But what the secretary said to me, is even though they might know things and we might know things, they could not generate the political will without being able to point to evidence. So I was a skeptic and actually said no three times. The secretary actually drove to, I live in the East Bay, and drove to take me out to dinner a couple of times trying to talk us into doing this study. And I said no because of the fear that we didn't need to keep describing it. And it was interesting to hear from policymakers saying that they needed the political cover to do things, that they needed to point to something that was objective so that they could do things. We do a fair amount of both implementation science research and RCTs and other intervention research at the BHHI. Those are incredibly costly. And I think that this framework is still important. Like the single most important study, I think, of homelessness in our generation is not this, but is something called the Family Option Study, which trialed different outcomes for um, four different options to deal with family homelessness. It showed very clearly that giving permanent rental subsidies is the path to end family homelessness. But to be honest, they didn't do a good job on this thing, and it came out, and it got totally buried. And in fact, even though the outcome showed clearly one of the options, what got transmitted was one of the options that was not actually shown to be effective because I think they didn't set it up for success. Um, in terms of how to get the federal government, to pay for meaningful research, that's a question for another day, and if you have any ideas, I'll know. And then the one other thing I'll say about advocacy is we think it's important for us to, um, we sort of admit to being unabashed advocates for ending homelessness, but we think our role, our positionality in this 
is to actually sort of say, we're gonna follow the evidence, but we partner closely with advocacy groups who carry the advocacy for us. So we are in constant communication with them, but we think it's important for there to be a body that is seen as somewhat neutral to be able to say it. I mean, I, I wonder if you might reflect from the experience or the perspectives of the lead, did you ever feel like this wasn't moving quickly enough towards something that was going to house people? Actually, in, in the midst of it all, it felt like it was moving really, really fast. And I, I think that the, the aspect of communication depends on your perspective. Um, oftentimes, there is not bi-directional communication that happens, particularly with folks with lived expertise. And quite honestly, the amount of um, feedback and explanation that um, folks who are conducting this study provided to lived expertise advisory board members um, was both heartening and um, sadly shocking. And, and I think there was a the part in, in our presentation that talked about um, talking to lead members about their feedback about why you did and also didn't do something that was recommended. And I, I want to make sure that we, we hearken back to that because doing a, or making a recommendation as a, a lead member and then having it uh, bear fruit or come to fruition in the study feels good, right? Like I said something and, and it was listened to. But oftentimes communities offer advice that is not taken and no one ever goes back and says, this is why we didn't. And there's lots of great reasons why you wouldn't do something. But all I feel is bereft if you never follow back up with me and tell me why the thing I recommended wasn't useful in this case. And that, I think, made the whole process much more clear we weren't just dropping information into some random funnel that was never ever going anywhere. And quite honestly, though I'm sure to people who are currently experiencing unsheltered house, homelessness, that they, they don't feel the effects of the study. But in my, my proximity to it, it, it feels like things are different now. It feels like we know things and now we can do things because that's how the process works. And so while I understand that all of this um, takes time, you know, you have to gather the data and then you have to develop interventions and then you have to actually implement them. The reality is that this data set is so instrumental in the work. Um, my day-to-day -day job is working with the California State Legislature. I'm very, very blessed to have a job that first of all affords me the opportunity to come here and speak with you today, um, which every job doesn't have that luxury. So the fact that I have a job that I can be here with you is I'm very grateful for. But beyond that, I hear all the time from ledge staff well, the CASPA report, they have no idea I had anything to do with it, but they talk about it all the time. And so that means it's meaningful. That means it's making a difference. That means it's making its way into policy. And so to your point, yes, it is slow, but when you take the time and you explain to people what you're doing and you ask them for their feedback and you have a meaningful dialogue and develop a relationship, then time starts to feel different. I love that. I know we have a lot of questions, so I'm gonna go on um, to the back. Hi everyone, thank you so much. This is such an illuminating um, and robust presentation. Uh, my name is Sonia Goch Avila. I'm with the Person-Centered Reproductive Health Program out of Family and Community Medicine. Um, and I really appreciate you speaking to the challenging political moment that we are currently experiencing in the policy section around the hyper-criminalization of people experiencing homelessness and, um, and low-income people. Um, and I'm sure you all are well aware of uh, Proposition F, the recent city ordinance, which um, requires people who are receiving cash assistance to undergo drug screening and mandatory treatment in order to qualify. Um, and I'm just curious, based off of your experience with these participants who have substance use disorders, who are using drugs, how do you anticipate this um, impacting people experiencing homelessness in San Francisco? 
I think um, one of our most um, important findings, but I think this shows that you can find things and then have government bodies not listen to you, is that among people who had signal, you know, obviously we did not do diagnostic tests. And, and I think what the public misses is there's a big difference between addiction and using substances, right? Those are not the same thing. But we tried in a 45 minute interview to get signal to what might be addiction and looking at folks who likely had probable addiction of either alcohol or, or substance use, 26% had told us that during this episode of homelessness, they had sought treatment and been unable to access it. And 21% told us that they were currently seeking treatment and were unable to access it because of limitations in the um, availability of treatment. We know, and actually now the head of NIDA, um, has now come out and said in various public forums that the data is in forced treatment doesn't work. Um, but, but also, um, we also tried to make the point that we know whether or not you believe in forced treatment, <laughs> we know that your chance of success is much higher in people with a readiness to change. And we are so far, so far from meeting the need out there right now, and that everything we should be doing should be first trying to meet, you know, to meet that need. But I think that is sort of a heartbreaking example of where policy doesn't always follow evidence. I, I can tell you that I spent several hours on the phone with a Chronicle um, Ed board, uh, editorial board, um, answering their questions, and they actually came out against Prep F, um, but Prep F passed overwhelmingly, so. I think right here. Hi, <coughs> excuse me. Hi, my name is Carrington Osborne, and I'm a consumer advocate uh, and consumer advocacy panel for the San Francisco um, Community Clinic Consortium. And my, I, have a point and then a question. First of all, I want to thank you for the study. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, as someone who has previously experienced homelessness, this study told my story. I was over 50. I was suffering from trauma. I had chronic illness, um, my arthritis, and I was depressed and suffering from PTSD. Um, Suffice to say, all of this led to a crisis where I actively became suicidal, and it literally took my being suicidal to get me into a treatment program and to get me housed. And lo and behold, once I'm housed, I'm able to meet with my therapist, go to group, and I am the functional person you see before you. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, but one of the things that struck me, um, looking at the numbers, and if I'm correct, there also was 6% of the population was Asian Pacific Islander. And adding up the numbers, that means 79% 70, of the unhoused people in California are people of color. And so my question is, where is the MALDEF? Where is the NAACP? Where is the gay and lesbian community, especially for our non-binary and transsexual folks who suffer extreme abuse, both on the street and in the public, in terms of the news. Um, and I was curious, have you done outreach to them, um, Reverend Barber, with the war on poverty? Because what put me out in the street wasn't my depression, it was my poverty. Uh, my mental health led me down the road to being marginally in, uh, employed then unemployed but I was renting a boat in a marina in Emeryville because that's what you can live on for $400 a month. But there are no protections. And so when that came to an end, it was that poverty that put me out in the street. And that's what this study um, talks about. But the question was in terms of the outreach to civil rights organizations and also just one of the things that enabled me to be where I am was because of the Mission Neighborhood Resource Center, the Mission Neighborhood Health Center, um, organizations that serve people who are experiencing homelessness or marginally housed. Um, and 
is there a portion in your call for the increased funding of those type programs with outreach coordinators to get the message out of these crucial services? But again, trying to get people healthy when they're unhoused is an extreme challenge. And I could not have made this transition if I weren't housed. I think one of the policy recommendations, maybe um, toward the middle uh, when Margot was going through them, is is that the key uh, piece of, of of outreach, and and quite honestly, um, government entities do that very poorly. It has to be the um, the nonprofit organizations, advocacy organizations that do that uh, with a trauma informed lens, that do that with a the kind of care and compassion and understanding that housing is a human right, and those organizations require funding in order to operate successfully. Um, the most important thing in any program is, is, or the most expensive thing in any program is people, uh, closely followed by the buildings in which they operate. And generally speaking, um, funders don't have uh, the best proximity to that information. They don't really understand it. So it requires a lot of advocacy on the part of, of nonprofit organizational leaders. Um, and having been a nonprofit organizational leader, I was the deputy chief program officer at the Sacramento LGBT Community Center, um, which opened four housing programs particularly for the reason that you've described. Um, and um, I stopped doing that work, quite honestly, because I was exhausted. I was trying to finish my doctorate and trying to hold together housing programs. Those things don't go together in the pandemic. Um, so honestly, it's there's, there's fatigue and um, exhaustion on the part of nonprofit leaders to do the advocacy, to do the funding, to be able to continue the work. Right? When you're doing the work, you can either do the work or you can write grants to fund the work, but doing the work and writing the grants, it, it, that's a lot. It's for one person or a team of people. So to your point, uh, it requires a, a large scale movement and voice for organizations to spe speak uh, to foundations, to speak to government, to say, these things have to be prioritized and paid for. It may feel like to someone who is sitting in an office with Google at the ready and working internet and um, a doctor that they could call up and go to whenever they're ready because their car is full of gas, that it's not a problem accessing services. Um, as Margot has described, most people who were a part of the study, which was shocking, had health care. The number of people who were able to access a doctor within a six month period was shockingly low. And that's because in some of the places where the study was conducted, public transportation wasn't very robust and connected. Um, having the funds to be able to access public transportation wasn't easy. So all of those things combined together create a landscape of why that outreach, somebody going to where people are experiencing homelessness, homelessness is necessary. But that is viewed as the least important part by someone who is paying for it because they wanna pay for people to write reports and they wanna pay for people to justify why they're giving them the money. But actually talking to the people who are most proximate to the problem, that's the least important part for those folks. And so reframing what is important in a project has to come from, from, from you all. How about that? How, how, about, how about a call to action? Every single one of you, if you were to call up your local uh, officials and say, this has to happen, it makes a much greater impact than if people who are experiencing homelessness got together, put all their tents up at the state capitol, and then complained. That would mean nothing. But when you call, when you write letters, when you engage in community activism, it makes all of the difference. It's, it's unfortunate because the, no one life is more important than the others, but there's your charge for the day. We can get you a list of who you should call, and if you call them, that will make a difference. I, I wanted to also address what you were asking and saying. First of all, I just wanna um, uplift you, uplift your story. Yeah. Thank you for being vulnerable and sharing with us. And I want to say, 
I mean, I cannot tell you, I was personally in the field doing interviews and listening to interviews, how many people said the same thing, that that is, that is such a foundation of the story. So I wanna answer your question in two ways. First, as it comes to the study, um, yes, yeah, so we talked about the community engaged boards, the three boards that we had, and we had people across the country who are working on racial justice, who are working on housing justice, and who are working on racial justice and homelessness that were part of our boards and that could uplift those messages that we were trying to send in our communication strategy, but could also help us to analyze how race matters in thinking about this issue. So I wanna say that. But I also wanna say that it is shocking to me how new <laughs> um, the, the sort of like the, the dialogue around the fact that housing is a racial justice issue that homelessness is a racial justice issue. This is, this is like, we're on the forefront of people really turning over and saying, you cannot talk about homelessness if you do not talk about racial justice, if you do not talk about redlining, if you do not talk about slavery, all of these historical, um, very consciously constructed anti-black, anti-native, anti-Japanese, right? Um, laws and policies that um, have displaced communities of color from their land again and again and again, have consciously again and again ensured that communities of color are more likely to be in poverty than other communities, ensured that communities of color have a harder time buying homes than other communities, than white communities, right? The end of all of these systems, the education system, we could go on and on is homelessness, right? Um, the job, that as segregation and racial injustice in on who gets what jobs, right? It, at the end of that, if you fall through the cracks of those systems, you are more likely to experience homelessness. And so part of what we're doing at the BHHI is exactly what we're doing today and saying, we will not talk about this without talking about the fact that yes, black and indigenous and people of color are much more likely to experience homelessness, and this is not an accident. This was constructed through policies and attitudes over centuries, right? And so if we can, again, with the changing the culture and changing the narrative leads to part, part of leading change is saying, yeah, you're completely right. <laughs> um, and, and we have to say it out loud and make sure that every time anybody is in a room talking about homelessness, we're saying it out loud. Thank you so much. What a phenomenal panel. Uh, I recognize there are many other questions. We are going to pull these threads into our next session, which is on labor, citizenship, and health. So I hope we will have an opportunity to continue some of the dialogue. I apologize to those people who have microphones. Thank you to our panelists. Tremendous. We are going... We are going to take a coffee break and reconvene at 1045 to continue the discussion.